couple, you might say. Making a clean sweep of the music game, perhaps. Possibly a B group. Or is he merely intent on picking up a nice piece of fluff? Whatever he's up to, there's a pun to fit the occasion. After all, it's a strange scene, man. There's this girl with a soprano sax and this fella with a hoover, looking most earnest. <laughs> with, all the, with all the wires sort of dangling around me. I think that's great. Oh, God. I can't believe it. <laughs> Barbara Thompson is one of Britain's leading jazz musicians. A composer and multi-instrumentalist on tenor, alto, soprano saxophone, clarinet and flute, she's been playing in a variety of bands since her student days at the Royal College of Music in the early 60s. She's married to John Heisman, a self-taught virtuoso drummer who during the past 10 years has led three rock bands, the best known of which was Colosseum. This year, after Coliseum split up, he and the bassist Dill Katz joined Barbara and her keyboard player Colin Dudman in Barbara's own quartet, Paraphernalia. Barbara and John had met in 1965 when they were both playing in the New Jazz Orchestra. But since then, they have played together only occasionally each mainly following a separate musical path. Barbara in jazz, John in rock. It's easy when you look at it. See, I, know, I have a suspicion that, that, that when you get playing it, it's it. something else has evolved there. That's the point. Well, in that case, I'm playing five. If you're doing it halfway between five and six... So in a sense, this first rehearsal of the new quartet was the beginning for them of a new musical relationship this time on a regular basis. Well, let's go from where Dill... But you see, you've been playing it so fast, I think, that it hasn't mattered. Mm. Because everybody just feels the down. Yeah. And you just play that, actually, don't you? You just yeah. play, you know. Done. But at slower speed, you've now got to make the beats, and that's going to be a whole different... Mm. <laughs> 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 oh, it's too much to do. Well, well, that's a spokesman of a 5 eight contingent. Right. <laughs> right. I think we'll carry on with stairways now. Um, I was the first person to do music at my school for 10 years, I think. So I used to shut myself up, up in my room and practice an awful lot, which is really good because it became a real obsession in a way. So I used to practice for hours by myself and play to records. I mean, I had no knowledge of jazz, really. And it was about the age of 15 or 16 that I, I heard a saxophone. It was just an instrument at that moment in time, which I liked, and I played for fun, sort of, once a month, have a little tootle on it, but I, I never really did anything weird.
Stairway is just really an old fashioned um, medium tempo ballad. <laughs> it's quite a selfish number for myself because it's a nice chord and an easy going theme and uh, easy for me to play, play on it really. And, you know, I never know always exactly what I'm going to play, but it's that sort of number. It features the, the tenor saxophone um, in its warmness. <laughs> It's supposed to be the test anyway, really, if you can play something slow. And, you know, if you hear some great saxophone players wailing on slow things, then, uh, you know, that's the nicest thing you can hear. force within the band, the drums, they, they supply so much of the, the tensions or the serenities, if you like, to the music, aside from the melodic content which the tunes and things supply. I feel the drums are simply a catalyst in the group context. They can make the group sound edgy and they can make the group sound very relaxed and they can, they can push the group forward and they can sit back, make the group sit back. And above all, when a soloist is, is playing, they are always out on their own. They're being backed by people, and, and the drums can push the soloist into areas that they didn't know they could get into. In other words, the drums can take a soloist where they've not been before, push them out on a limb, and then they have to hold it together themselves. And that is the performance which an audience reacts to. What is unusual about Barbara, I think, is not that she, she started to play an instrument like many girls in, 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 in high schools and things learn to play instruments in this country. I don't think it's a freak thing. The thing is the switch that took place of Barbara's own volition across from what could perhaps have been a very interesting classical career, who knows, and into jazz or into dance music, first of all, and then on to jazz, but at a very early age in her musical development, which was uh, just something from her own head, I think. I did the usual sort of classical repertoire, which every clarinetist that ever existed always plays a bit of. That's the, that's, that's the bit I learnt. I, I learnt it all the way through. I think when I was about um, 10, the uh, Bart Goes to Town. It was really great. I, I should be able to play it better than that, really. It's terrible. <laughs> but I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> After playing the saxophone, the flute is quite difficult to play. It's not the, the most difficult to finger, but it's your mouth shape that makes the sound. And I do this all the way uh, down the instrument, all the way up to the top, so I mean it can take sort of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I'm trying to improve the sound on each note. I mean I could start off quite woolly and then after a bit the sound comes um, uh, clear. I don't play the flute in a classical way. Classical musicians play with very silvery sounds. I concentrate on a broader, more powerful sound because I have to compete with the electric instruments behind me. So 
the, the soprano is a very sort of more a flowing instrument and uh, free. It's very limited in as much as it's only got two and a half octaves. Every saxophone player under the sun works on the uh, register above. So, I mean, the official limit to say a soprano saxophone is sort of... You see, that, that, that's the limit. So I just work on um, doing higher notes, sort of... A, Sort of so that when I'm actually playing uh, solos, jazz solos, things like that, I can expand the register a bit. So I try and keep my lip up there because, like a trumpet player, you tend to get very, um, you know, blister inside if uh, if I don't keep myself in tune. <laughs> saxophone is the one thing where it's trial and error. I mean, to hear, listen to other people that you like and to get their sound, uh, practice getting their sounds. I mean, I wanted just to play like Johnny Hodges when I got my alto saxophone, so I practice from a record playing like Johnny Hodges. And of course, then Coltrane on the soprano. <laughs> Roland Kurt always liked his way of playing the tenor as well. Using two saxophones in this piece, I'm not interested so much in melody as texture. The tenor saxophone is very good for some sort of things, in particular for melodies, I think, and more sort of rocky things. Sometimes, actually, I have such little time to change that I don't, I don't manage to change into time, so we have a, a few extra bars while the band wait. <laughs> Auditioned for Ivy Benson Land and was accepted. But when I sat down for the first rehearsal, they were playing swing music. I found that I, you know, I just didn't couldn't make head or tail of what was going on. The reading is different. The uh, phrasing is completely different from classical music. It was a very good experience. I did that for four months. When I went to Royal College of Music, I had one purpose in mind, which was to carry on with what I'd learnt from Ivy. Physician Barbara Thompson, who quit a pop group after refusing to wear a bikini costume, relaxes at home last night. That was my passing shot to them, really. You know, that I, <laughs> I didn't anyway want to do that. And um, the next thing we know, I, one of them must have told the press, because John and I, it was just when we got married, I think, and we got bombarded by the press, didn't we, suddenly, from early morning, with them all taking pictures, um, and uh, over that particular thing. I did so many different things in those days. Some were musically very serious and others were quite frivolous things. I mean, I did sort of did anything that came along, really, for the experience. I, I even played in a strip club, actually. It was Cabaret, the last kind of work of that type you did? Well, it, it was 
just the, the, la the, the last sort of Shirley Entertainment um, project I was involved in because I was just there on the stage in the Kit Kat <laughs> stage band. I, know, I could have been anyone there with this long wig on and, and all that. Cast used to sort of call me Jean Harlow actually because I used to get very fed up and be very serious looking. And um, that was the last thing and in fact that convinced me a year of doing cabaret, playing for 15 minutes a night, the same thing every night, just convinced me that either I was going to do something that demanded more of me or I was going to quit. You know, anything was better than that. So that's really what put me onto the, the path that I'm in now. I started at the age of about 15 and uh, that wasn't really a start in that I had a washboard and I had a paint can and a boys brigade symbol, skiffle. And I would play on a Sunday morning from 11 o'clock in the morning until 2 or 3 in the afternoon to the radio, which meant that I played uh, right the way through two way family favourites, which of course could be have been Beethoven's Fifth Symphony at one moment and Pat Boone the next. Uh, and, and then right the way through the Billy Cotton Band Show and on through Meet the Huggets, listening to the programme and playing the little uh, asides that link the scenes together. So that I wasn't learning anything that I knew I was learning, but I was simply playing to what I heard. And every so often when I wasn't sure what to do, I'd stop and listen. It was three years before I saw a live drummer, another live drummer actually, a real professional drummer actually playing. And for two years, I didn't realise that the snare drum had snares on the bottom of the drum that make it sound like that, as opposed to, which is just the normal tom-tom sound. And I saw these, these uh, bands of wire along the, along the bottom of the snare, which press up against the head and give it that characteristic sound, and I thought it was, it was some kind of protection that was used on the head. I mean, that was two years after I thought of myself as being a drummer. So, you know, there wasn't any sort of great sort of wash of, of rock groups being presented by all the medias in those days. It was, it was all a much more sort of amateur business than I think youngsters get today, when they can switch on the television almost any night of the week and see in one go exactly what's possible. do a, a number now which features John Moore on the bass. This is a track from the Electric Savage album. It's all about Clint, Clint Eastwood and uh, all that team. A western called Desperado. That's me checking out the audience. <laughs> God, that's fast. What one hears varies from night to night. One's totally reliant upon monitors. I don't hear anything from the keyboards that are really from the keyboards. I only hear what comes through my monitor setup. The same for the guitar, the vocals, some nights I can hear the bass, often uh, I have to have them in the monitors as well. The drums are very loud where I am, I'm playing the drums very loudly there because the volume from the other instruments is such that often I go home whole nights not hearing too much sound from the drums, I can feel them but I don't hear them too good. <laughs>
biggest single problem with this kind of group, an all-electric band playing in general big places with a lot of equipment, lights, road crews, is the fact that it's very easy to find yourself in a situation where you just aren't hearing the music that's being played. So what you're hearing now is something you've never heard before? Oh yes, that's fascinating. And, and I mean, I, can, I, can, I would play this differently now, just hearing this like this. And somehow, when you hear it in a studio, the quality is so good that you hear all the incidentals that you play. And of course, it's the incidentals that make the thing seem to work then. When you hear it on a television, so much of what you play is, is lost that you just hear the broad outline of what you're doing. And in fact, listening to this number, which is very fast, I would have to find a different way to play this because it's not coming across rhythmically the way it should or the way it does on the album where you can hear all the little nuances because of the way it's mixed and... The drum part on this is not good. Not the way it's heard here. It's out of balance. You can't hear the other side to the beat. You just hear that off going every time. Now that Colosseum split up, do you feel sad looking back? Oh no, no, no. I must say, sadness is not part of it at all. No. I think that uh, the band stopped because the guys wanted to do different things, and I think that's absolutely what it's about. I think you can do the same thing too long. The first band, the first Colosseum was only three years. Tempest was 18 months. Um, I think it's a long time to do non-stop on one project. And uh, I think, you know, we got it to a kind of peak of what the, f the four guys could give collectively. And after that, you either repeat yourself or it's simply not as good. And so I think that there's, there's a very... Uh, important point where you don't need, you, I don't think we, I mean, we never discussed the fact that probably we had got out of it as individuals what we needed to take from the machine, the monster. And then after that it was a good idea to knock it on the head. When you actually finish a band, you finish it for all sorts of other much more superficial reasons. But underneath it all, I think we we achieved, in a way, what we set out to achieve, or, if not what we set out to achieve, because I don't think we perhaps did that, we probably achieved what we were capable of as a mix of people and personalities and abilities. So be it. It's fine by me, absolutely fine. not a free drummer. He lays down things and they so they know that a rock piece will be pretty strong and the jazz piece, again, um, he will always give it an identity. What are the breaks you do in the middle? You do them differently again. Yeah, but they're accents, aren't they, from the rhythm section? If he can't put a feel to something, well, then it really won't work. Have you got those accents on your part? And the other thing is, John, you don't start playing time until we get to the theme. Ah, what happens before then? Well, this bit. <laughs> John is a sort of drummer who will push you 
He's a very pushy drummer. A lot of people don't like this. They like TikTok drummers, but I don't. I like drummers who go with you. Shall we do the breaks about a few times so we don't begin? The longer you let something evolve in your mind, the better it is. If you try and do it in a hurry, it never works out, especially with, uh, when you're working with jazz musicians, because you, you try things out and, and it doesn't work. And you've got to be the first to say, right, I'll throw it away. So a lot of the stuff I write, I just don't use. I mean, I'd say 50% of it. <laughs> I might start out with an idea and finish it and just use the thing in the end that came at the end and was like eight bars. So I might get eight bars out of running hundreds of bars, but at least it's the right eight bars. Oh, yes. Right, well, let's go back to the music. Let's do it now. Good fun, music. I'll cope with all that. It's a very neat looking part you've got there anyway. Yeah, I wrote it. Did you ask her? Mm -hmm. Well, I did. Right. <laughs> Something again. Yes, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Colin Dubman composes quite a lot of what we play, some very nice things, and he knows how to score out for um, instruments, probably better than, than myself because he's got a degree in music. And, Things like this. So he's a classical, uh, classically trained musician as well. The uh, bass player, uh, Dil Katz, he, he um, is sort of coming up with riffs and things like this, and we're sort of co writing things. Initially, I started off with the usual classical background, but I um, started playing jazz fairly young, and then I reacted against jazz and uh, thought that I should get back to classical music, so I went to university. And then another reaction set in, and <laughs> I found myself back in the jazz field. enjoy working with Barbara. I think it sets up a certain amount of sympathy really because we're aware of uh, wider musical horizons than just jazz. The Tranquility Down, it's a peaceful piece, hence the title which means peace of mind. And it gives Colin and myself a, a chance to hear the actual sounds of our instruments. interested in all kinds of music, from Debussy to Indian music, and I find it a great shame that when you turn the radio on in this country, there's very little jazz. And when it is there, it's often very late at night. Yeah. Dylan and John have got more rock backgrounds, actually. I think there's probably a stronger rock influence in the band now that they've joined. And then it, then it goes free, onto a mode after that. And then yeah. I give four the bars, I put break, my fingers that hang up like this. is a quaver, then, isn't it? That is One, two, three, fills, four, done. Yeah. 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 I always seem to pick up on the crotchet, the last what? crotchet. Go on, two, two three, go on. Go, go, go.
Should you do that same bit again? Because I'm not quite sure. My other experience really entailed uh, what I would call lightweight playing, involved in a rather uh, sort of more dubious underground activity, immersed in nightclubs and uh, Italian restaurants and uh, sort of dingy Irish forums playing furtive Cayley music and things like that, you know. Barbara's compositions. Um, I feel there's a, uh, almost as a strange sort of juxtaposition of melodic stuff and uh, a great tendency to persuade the player to behave <laughs> perhaps slightly insanely within a normal uh, context. I often feel that. I feel pushed to that. Pushed to some sort of borderline which I don't know I could, which I haven't discovered yet but perhaps is within me. <laughs> really until I turned professional when I was 22 that I really came to terms with the difference between playing what I felt and actually beginning to put the thing together and I'd never cease to work at it and if you knew the number of times I uh, am so upset with the with the kind of inadequacy that I feel about this movement around the kit, just the physical side of it, that I will simply come back and go right to left, right from the beginning and again, and build it all the way through again. We've got three basic movements for the hands. We've got single strokes. Very simple, it would seem, at first sight, and yet the rudiment or the scale of drumming, which is called a single stroke, is about the most difficult of the rudiments to execute properly. One beat follows the other. But to produce that in control, each beat placing itself on the drum in a very small area with exactly the same amount of volume uh, means that when you're actually in a playing situation, you're able to place beats anywhere and feel that you are exactly in control of the amount of power or quietness, sense of touch that you want to give each beat. Although I've got quite a few drums around me, each with a different pitch, in the end, all we really have is loud and quiet. The more drums we have, the more varied tones we can get. But loudness and softness is in fact everything with the drum kit, because that is our chief form of expression. Playing that, giving you that little demonstration of loud and quiet, a loud beat followed by a very quiet beat, we have, in fact, the second of the scales of drumming the rudiments, two beats. Two beats with each hand. We have the single stroke, we have the double stroke, we have the flam have the first of the combination beats, which is called a paradiddle. Two single strokes, alternating hands, followed by a double, which then reverses the hands. So we have right, left, right, right, and then left, right, left, left. By playing eight beats, we're back where we started. Now this rudiment, this scale, is perhaps the most commonly used scale of all, the paradiddle. Because it has all sorts of applications. And if I demonstrate its applications, 
when you consider that there are 26 standard American drum scales or rudiments, and then God knows how many variations upon those, you begin to realize that if you apply the same kind of extensions to all the other rudiments, you begin to see how this whole language can be built up, and yet at the same time, become so part of you that when you're playing, that's the last thing you're thinking of. You're, you're just hearing the things that you want to play, and it's... So, the paradiddle then, uh, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. It doesn't have much function like that. But if we accent, that is to say, we play the first of each paradiddle louder than the other notes, you immediately begin to have a rhythm. You have a loud beat followed by three quiet beats. You have a pulse going and you have a ground rhythm running underneath. By having uh, two bass drums, it simply enables me to split my legs either side of the snare drum for a comfortable playing position for everything else, but I treat it as one bass drum. The race of people, drummers, are quite different, it seems to me, from, from other musicians. They gather in, in dark halls and they, they look at drum kits for hours. It's a very physical business right from the moment you, you, you buy it and take it out of the shop all the way through. They talk a lot about the fittings and... and uh, because a lot of their life is spent packing them away and setting them up again and it's a big complicated business and it's heavy and you have to pick them up and lug them around and pack them in cases and unpack them. Every symbol here has a different job. Everyone is a different kind of symbol. These symbols are made to perform a specific function and they're repeatable, and that's important for me. There's been this explosion in the marketability of these kind of goods, so it's become much easier to actually find things that one likes and then be able to reproduce them. This is a crash symbol, and it's exactly what it says. You, you strike it a glancing blow wherever you fancy, and... You produce that kind of sound. This is a ride cymbal, which means you use the tip of the stick and you simply play uh, halfway between the bell and the outside. And for accents, you halved the stick against it. And you can play the bell. This is a little crash symbol, and it's there so that whichever of these two I'm on, I can, I can, I can hit it. Otherwise, I will be forced often, if I want to put a quick crash in, to hit something like this symbol, and this is not a good symbol, it's too long when you use it as, the, as a crash. So this is... Just a little push symbol. This is a china, 24-inch china. We've got th four playing areas on this symbol. We've got this area. We've got a main ride area, which is here. We've got the ridge here, which we hit with the half for accents. And we've got the final deeper crash on the, on the edge. And mainly we use this area and this half here. We play our accents here and our taps.
about the drum solo itself? Well, the drum solo itself is a visual thing as well as a, 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 an audio thing. I'm never sure they work. It keeps me fit, mind you. If you've got to play 20 minutes or 15 minutes or even 10 minutes, flat out really, with everything you know and putting it together in such a way that the audience comes with you through each door that you open as you layer and layer the rhythms and the time and the textures on top of each other. If you can take the audience and in the end get them to erupt with you as you erupt at the end, then, then, then you are actually becoming at one with the audience. They always, they join you. For me, the last eight bars before the solo is crucial because it's that that kicks me into the solo. In this Indian piece, I base the first part of the drum solo on a very complicated rhythm. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. first half of the drum solo, I'm actually playing that rhythm and then at a point I break the time completely. And then I set up things with my feet and play over the top of them, uh, trying again to keep this Indian flavour to it. Indian music is multi-layered. There are circular, repetitive rhythms going on underneath, with freer things happening on top. And then that really takes me through to the climax where I, I restate, just on the bass drums, the basic pattern. And then bring the band in by playing the pattern twice on the top, which is their cue. Balancing family life uh, with being a professional musician uh, can always be a bit difficult. Uh, it's difficult now, of course, because whenever we go away, we're, we're away together. It used to be a lot easier because our careers were going on separate paths and we were seldom away uh, at the same time, except, of course, for the four or six weeks a year that we worked together in the German band of band leaders, the United Jazz and Rock Ensemble. Let's have a look, shall we? Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Guten Morgen, liebe Freunde. Guten Morgen allerseits. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen in Stadt und Land. Guten Morgen zusammen. Hello, Dad. Hello. 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 Hello.
enthusiastic and encouraging to me when I talked to them. But just one time when they were particularly emotional it was in Germany when I was very pregnant. They uh, they got quite not worried about it, but they just found it a uh, rather unusual experience watching me play when I was pregnant. <laughs> I've been involved in a few teaching courses and I've seen young girls and, and they've got as much blow and as puff and as much go as the men, if not more, actually, some of them. But it's just a question of whether they, they keep it up. I mean, you really have to be able to do a lot of things. It's not just playing, it's um, driving, touring, it's um, business. You know, so much involved in being a professional jazz musician it's not even like being a classical musician because at least if you're a classical musician your um, things are organized for you I mean you're not for example I have to have my own PA and things like this and be able to set it up and if I don't have a road manager and this sort of thing it's a lot of it's very physical and I have to carry a lot of stuff around so I refuse to believe that it's difficult for a woman I just think it in her head if she wants to do it she can do it and I just think there aren't enough who do. So I'm not a talented keyboard player or piano player. I mean, my coordination is just not very good, but learning it has always stood me in good stead. So I study composition and counterpoint, so there, there are certain laws and rules, and I often stick to them. If I write a piece, it's got a definite form and shape to it, and when people are playing it, and I consider what they can do, and what they will add to it and present them in, in a way that they'll do what I want them to do, but it's at the same time it's what they want to do. And when I originally wrote this Spanish based piece for the United Jazz Rock Ensemble, I wrote it with everyone in the band in mind, and the piece opens with uh, trumpet cadenzas, uh, just on very simple sort of open chords. You know, Ian comes in with a you know, sort of cadenza, da 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 da, you know, sort of thing. Uh, act comes in it. And then Kenny. And they do um, a bit together. Adapting it for the quartet was quite easy, really. The only person who comes off worse, in a way, is myself, because instead of having breathers, I have to play the theme all the way through. <laughs> and it's not an easy theme, either. Also, you can't hide behind other people, because it's, technically it's difficult to play. of leaving the children for long intervals. And I'm never away for more than two weeks. And when I come back, I make sure that I'm home for three to four weeks as well. And so it's at intervals. Is traveling one of the most exhausting aspects of the business? Yes, I mean, it's much more, diff much more exhausting. A, a long day's traveling uh, is much more exhausting than doing two hours on a stage. But the worst aspect of it for me is the sheer waste of time. I, uh, I really can go away for six weeks 
um, and be touring all oh, three or four hundred kilometers every day in, in a vehicle, say, and in aeroplanes. And if you add up the number of hours you're on stage compared with the number of hours you spend actually traveling, it's, it's an enormous difference. <laughs> The children are very well looked after. We've got some really wonderful housekeeper who is really like a second mum and they're very fond of her. And so we really can trust her and feel that they're having everything done for them that I would do. When the children protest, which they do, oh, you're not going away again, then we just say, well, uh, where do you think your pocket money comes from? Every afternoon, as they were coming from school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden. It was a large, lovely garden with soft green grass. Here and there, over the grass, stood beautiful flowers like stars. One day, the giant came back. When the giant arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? He cried in a very gruff voice. And the children ran away. My own garden is my own garden, said the giant. And I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. This piece started uh, from me reading a story to my little daughter. Um, it's based on an Oscar Wilde fairy story called The Selfish Giant. Well, you're the timekeeper. It's a bit manic, I think. It's got a lot of nice things in it, and when it came to thinking about what to write next, I thought I'd base a suite on it. Do you think the batteries are out? Well, it's very, very quiet. It's It starts with playtime in the giant's garden, and then the giant theme which is a sort of funky theme, and then a storm sort of sequence, which is quite way out. I can't hear Barbara's wah-wah. All I can give us. Well, I mean, I never have it that loud usually. We're essentially a live group, but when we're recording in the studio, like with our new album, Wild Tales, we start off with a basic track and with one or two overdubs and the way it's mixed, it will sound quite different at the end. I now know my playing so I can be much more cool towards it and analytical and critical but without trying to destroy myself in the process. And in a studio, of course, you can't get away with anything. <laughs> Shall we turn some of those oxide particles into musical notes? We do it again, Martin. Okay. One, two, three. When I came to write the section which I call Winter Song, I really wanted to get as many sounds that depicted the sound of a storm. So when you're using a synthesizer, you can get a lot of sort of hurricane sounds like wind noises and storm and thunder and lightning and this sort of thing. And it all sounds quite dramatic, but at the same time, I sort of, in a way, take the mickey out of it because I have it on a, a boogie type backing. So really, uh, it's quite pictorial. I made the music as pictorial as possible, but put a lot of themes on as well.
when the storm reaches its climax. There's then what I'd call a sort of storm whistle, which is held, a very long, peaceful but slightly way out chord, over which the linnet sings. And I do a duet with the linnet. And I found, in fact, a recording of a very tuneful linnet. He makes some really interesting sounds, and he's got his own little melody. And I just, in fact, I do a duet, and I repeat what he sings, and then I add a little bit of my own in the same sort of style. times when you almost gave up? I'm, I've never actually said I'm going to give up. I mean, frequently I get desperate, you know, because <laughs> I, you know, I either think I'm so awful and, you know, I'm, I, it's mainly through one, you know, sort of spiritual things, you know, because I'm never really satisfied with what I do. And this is something with music, you have to be very critical. And other people might not even notice it, but if you notice it yourself, then you've got to, it's only yourself that puts it right. I would never be content just to ride along. I suppose, really, if I could, it, it could be very easy for me never to do any practice now, never think, and never do anything new, and just play the same old things, and I'd probably get away with it for several years. Mm. You know, but I, I can't do that really because I have to cope with myself. <laughs> Having spent so long playing rock music, joining Barbara has reawakened uh, many of the ideas and values that I had when I first started playing. It's been a kind of homecoming for me, really. This is a film of highlights from the concert given in July by Barbara Thompson's quartet Paraphernalia during the 1979 Bracknell Jazz Festival. This is a Spanish bass piece, spaghetti western type thing which features still cats on bass and myself on soprano set.
Stairways is a ballad and it's quite simple and quite different from the other pieces we play but it's a piece that people like to hear because it shows the tenor saxophone off in all its different aspects.
this piece I found a Southeast Indian rhythm, very complicated one, which I put a melody to, and it features the synthesizer and the drums.
La tranquillité d'âme, which means peace of mind, is a Debussy-inspired piece. And it features the flute and piano acoustically, which makes a nice change from the other pieces we play. crazy sort of piece and we have a lot of fun playing it. It features the keyboards in particular and myself and flute.
Thank <laughs> you.